This was um, this sitting in the Lake District. That's one once again. It's one of them places that I've been to countless times. It's scaled with force in the Lake District. So this is kind of this is the body of water. This is water that originated in the Langdale Valley. Right. It was cascading down the valley um, through Chapel Star, which slows down and cascades over the weir and heads down. It ultimately ends up in Windermere. That's yeah. where it goes to. And there's a number of different waterfalls and, and fast flowing systems. And this one's at Skull with Force, as I mentioned. Um, it was when I got there. It was it, it, it's surrounded by trees. It's quite a narrow river because it forced its way through. It's surrounded by trees. There's rocks. You stood on boulders that are mossy green, so it's slippy and stuff like that. And um, trying to make sense of it when you're there can be quite difficult. It can be quite awkward. Yeah. And um, but I could see out in the water. I, I think I used 180 mil lens for this. I could see out in the water that this was all mossy green. All this area is mossy green here. And the water was that, it was quite a, quite a high flow at the time. It was cascading over, over this, this mossy green here and, and moving onwards. And I needed to get, I wanted to get that flow at the corner of the frame. So wonderful it's, curve, isn't it, for the bottom right there? It is, it's great. Oh, yeah. It just kind of finishes that edge of the frame. It's just a wonderful curve coming around there. And then um, I wanted these three separated. So where I positioned the camera in relation to them three was incredibly important. Because move it an inch or so that way and they should start crossing each other. Yeah. Um, but the other thing I wanted to do was, I could see in the top of the frame, I could see this little group of grasses here. Now, they were on a high part of the rocks, situated in the centre of the river. And if I position the camera just right, high enough, pointing down and at the right angle in relation to the subject, I yeah. could separate these three stones. But I could also bring out the fragility of these tiny plants that were surviving in the centre of this cascade in the corner yeah. of the frame. The other challenge I had once again was the steep, this was quite dark and shadow here, and this was a very overcast sky, yeah. very bright and white water. I was, I was trying, is that all white water then in the background? Cause, I mean, I was trying white. to work out what's going on in the background there, because it's, it, yeah. you know, it's, it's all white, there's no, there's no detail in the background there. No, it's all, that is white water. It's yeah. quite a wide river, you can imagine this river's been quite, yeah. Well, the rivers would be quite wide. This was at the foreground, and that and that was white going out to the far side. So quite a wide river. What you can see, the reason why this lends itself to the tonality here is this. There was a pile of trees above us. Uh, okay. So this is in shadow yeah. here. Yeah. So it's which, providing a bit of different differentiation with the background. With it. Exactly, and the tonality obviously altered the tonality here because this is in shadow. Yeah. Which is quite good because we didn't get too. I didn't get too much contrast between the highlights there and the shadows there. But because this was th these kind of small grasses were set against the white, they stood out. So it, in a sense, it worked perfectly well. Incredibly difficult to set up the camera to get the right position of it. Very, very difficult indeed. Um, but when it did, the, it, everything came together. Well, as I said, you've got this flow at the corner of the frame coming down here. You've got these cascades here, and the cascades going off the frame. And then just enough, luckily enough, with the exposure, just enough detail of yeah. the middle. Of the, that's the and sense. That's of, in between two two streams of white water, isn't it? Exactly, yeah. exactly right. Yeah, and that's just going off into the distance. And th you you can imagine the cascade of water here is very fast, so that's white. And the other side of that grass is, is very very fast and white. And yeah. it's this rock that's giving you that dark streak because that's slowing the water down, yeah. breaking the flow. So that kind of finished almost to the corner of the frame there, which yeah. is balances uh, the top of it. It balances, yeah. Although those grasses are. Uh, a fantastic example of, I mean, we are talking about balance before and, and mm. the fact that things don't have to be the same massive black to balance. No. It's because because those are very contrasty and your eyes drawn to contrast, they, they, those little grasses yeah. can balance all those dark rocks. Exactly. I mean, in t it's about things sharing different parts of the space. The, the, the space is the four corners and the, these all these things are occupying that particular space and sharing that space. And um, so what we've got is we've got these kind of this kind of gang of rocks all hanging out together at this corner here. And yeah. they're they're occupying that space. Um the fact that these are fine and fragile still they still occupy the space with a, a degree of pride really. You know, they're occupying mm. the upper part of the image. And so they're punctuating enough information and commanded their own space that they are, but there's a relationship between the two because yes. they're in the same environment, yeah. which is great. And you, or we can almost see the kind of, you know, what's beneath there. So that's almost ghostly like coming out there. But the balance of the image, when we talk about balance and weight in a black and white image, 
the, the greys here are kind of similar to the greys here. We've got very high key values at the corner there, and we've got a cross balance going right to the middle. The main body and weight of the image is there, right in the centre there. Well, uh, the other thing that, that we've been we've written about, we haven't really gone into, is is this this sense of gaze. Mm. With objects have a certain direction associated with them. I've called it gaze. Yeah, for yeah. But those rocks on the left are looking like they're, they're gazing to the left. Yeah. And when the flow of the water is helping that, and then the grasses on the top, yeah, are almost they're almost back to back, looking opposite to each other. So yeah. they're, they're pulling a, a, apart from each other almost. Yeah, they are. I mean, the shape of them, where they're kind of like a V shape, like that. I mean, in, in, in fact, what they do, it's almost like the grasses are overlooking the rocks. The rocks are struggling in it. Yeah. But the fragility of the grasses, they're actually stronger because they're out of the walls and these are not. These are being impacted by yeah. the power of the walls, the flow through the image. But the overall flow of the image going through, it's 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 one environment, it's one and the same, but it's it's two activities going on. It's them suffering, or them sort of surviving in strength out of the walls and these yeah. are being impacted by the walls coming through the frame. And um, it, it's, it was one of them whereby you had to make sense of what you had to or, or make order of the chaos. Yeah. It was very, very chaotic. And if you, it's difficult to imagine from this one particular segment of the landscape, but the trees blowing around in the wind stood on mossy, mossy sort of pebbles. You're in the river there, right? Yeah. Literally stood yeah. in the water, yeah. Mossy pebbles like this where your feet are sliding round and your you, hunter well, he's only filling up with river water. Yeah, and you're thinking, how long is this going to last? And how long can I stand here for? But I mean, but the, the whole thing kind of slowly but surely comes together. And I had, I knew exactly that I wanted that there and these three things separated within the body of water and that weight. And so this is obviously a detail in its own right. And then it was just position of the camera. But the other thing that was important to this, to this particular picture was. Um, a bit of swing and a bit of tilt. I'll just go in and show you. The, the detail of this was critically important because everything is so smooth in the image. Mm. The entire image is smooth. Actually, you can go zoom in a bit further because I'm this bit quite small, I think, on okay. some people's screens. Yeah. Is that okay? Yeah. Um, I, I had to do, apply a degree of tilt with the 5.4 camera because I wanted these to be critically sharp coming out of, which is this was a mass of water. Yeah. So when they peaked out, the textural contrast. Yeah, okay. the textural contrast was, but you can't rely on colour. Yeah. So the detail had to be there, and um, and you know the detail was the most important part of this. And once again, they're pin sharp. So a little bit of swing at the front of the camera. Yeah. So a little bit of swing, a little bit of tilt, and we go up to the grasses, which is the other side of the river. We can see they're pin sharp as oh, well. Fantastic. Yeah. So, but they're kind of emerging out the mist of water. So in terms of the overall, if in, it's, it's actually better, it sounds ridiculous, but it's actually better in print form. Because when you're in print form, your eyes instantly look at this. You kind of wander around these and look at these rocks. And then you go over to the top corner and think, let's have a look and see what these little things are doing up there. Yeah. And they're standing. They're actually quite still. Given the chaos of this old environment, all this water moving around, then when you go into the image, they're pin sharp because they're perfectly well, still. They are. They're almost like an anachronism there, aren't they? In the yeah, background. yeah. And, and, and once again, set against the white, so that lent itself to it, set against the white. And would you, would you have done much post processing on the on the? Um, Hardly anything. The next... Hardly anything at all. I mean, the most important thing was the initial scan to yeah. retain these highlights here, so they weren't blowing out, which was which is quite straightforward because it was in the it was in the negative itself. Oh, for the for the for the geeky people who use film. Yeah. Do you do a straight scan on here and then process? Or do you try and set the levels in the scanner? No. One thing one thing I always say about scanning black and white negs and stuff like that, don't try and make the little crummy preview window in your scanner software look sexy before it gets into Photoshop. Just get a... What, Set your scan off and just keep like default settings, even quite flat. I normally use a linear curve in Epson. Yeah, so reset everything on there. Reset everything so it's bog standard, it's a straight linear curve. Get it and, and then get your file into Photoshop. And when it's in Photoshop, hit Command L or Control L and just get your levels up and have a look at it straight away before you do anything else. And if, if your levels are clipped or your shadows or highlights are clipped, delete it and go back and do it again. Yeah. Don't be tempted to go, oh, I'm nearly there. I'll start working on it now. Because yeah. you'll always be working with an artifact of the original color. So the best thing to do is is just keep the really, excuse me, the real basics of it in. Yeah. So just get the basic raw file in and do that at the scanning stage and not try and push it. So it's almost literally a raw file. You don't do anything to it before it's coming not out. You're going to get a good starting point. Yeah, just get a good starting point and then go straight on from there.
And and just one more. Do you scan in colour or do you scan in black and white? I scan in sixteen bit grey scan. Right. Yeah. I scan a sixteen bit grey scan. I've tried RGB before. Yeah, it does give you the bigger file. I can get easily a bigger, big enough file with a five by four negative. Oh yes. Quite yeah. easily enough. Um, and what you tend to find in RGB is that you kind of got a colour cast in it when it comes in. You, you're working with a colour cast. So the, the, the best starting point in black and white is to get a, a good image that represents what you saw when you were out there with a good tonal range. You print it in your own particular way, the way it represents what you saw, and then you, you're able to produce a neutral print in the starting point. From then, then think about toning it. If, if you come along and try and produce a toned image straight away, then you can kind of lose your direction. You think, what should it, what should it have been like? You know, stepping backwards is quite difficult and frustrating as well. So. Yeah. Okay. Okay, should we look at the next one? Absolutely. Okay. Um, really, really. I mean, this is, this is actually quite a straightforward image at the time. This is taken on Ewig Bay in the Isle of, Isle of uh, Lewis. And... Um, it's an amazing, amazing location. You get these white sandy bays. Yes, yeah. This is Lewisham Nice, the, the, one of the oldest rocks at the surface of the earth. And it's kind of in colour. It's a kind of pinky orange. It varies in colours. It's a pinky reddy orange. It's a type of marble almost, isn't it? It Not is. Horrible. It's yeah. a crystalline rock. And it's, crystalline. A it's beautiful. It's very, very shiny, incredibly hard as well. Um, <clears throat> and as I say, you get these fantastic white sandy bays. And you get... Luckily enough for me, you get these Atlantic storms coming in. Yes. And I was very, very fortunate to be there. Uh, I'd say very fortunate. They come in. They're like, they're like catching a bus. They come in. Wait for the next one. Wait, <laughs> for, the next wait one. for the next yeah. one. Yeah, they come in all the time. But this was this was absolutely brilliant because, I mean, I got this magnificent sky. I mean, it was just, you know, the simplicity of the composition was there. I got this magnificent sky. I got uh, this kind of coastal reversal and contrast. Yes, yeah. Which is great. I mean, you, you get it only at the coast. You get this great reversal and contrast, all in deserts, incidentally, whereby the sky is darker than the ground. Yeah. And it's great. If you actually metered off some of these clouds, your meter would tell you otherwise. Your spot meter would tell you otherwise. Because some of these clouds would be lighter than this. Um, but you get this wonderful reversal of contrast, whereby you've got these wonderful dark skies and this very, very pale forward. It's, it's because you've got the massive brightness in the foreground, isn't it? It's, yes. It's, it's, it's all on a high tone. Yeah, Rather it than is. Just the odd highlight in the clouds. It is. It's absolutely brilliant, and it, it's it's basically what this was is is cla it's about it, this is a classic example of weight in black and white. I mean, the weight. I needed the weight at, at the top of the end, the top of the image there. So it, was, it was a really heavy sort of dark dark sky. There was no weight at the bottom at all because it was very very pale. You've got this shape here yep. on this side, and I use the stone to echo the shape on that side there. It's triangles and diagonals. It's triangles. It was, black and white is about shapes. It's about... And, and when you start... Because you can't use colour information, the next thing is kind of structure. And when you think about structures, then it's shapes. And shapes come into play quite a lot. So, well, as you say, Tim, this is like a kind of a triangular shape. This is occupying this corner, triangular shape. You've got a very dark corner there, a very pale... That's a dark triangular shape in that corner almost. This is very, very pale. And so it's a kind of play on shape. And that flow there is kind of echoed in the cloud there. So just waiting for the cloud to move. And it was obviously I was rewarded with this fantastic cloud structure. Mm, the the clouds look like they've, they've got beams coming out of them with the cirrus, the, the very yeah. high, cold yes. uh, clouds coming out of the top. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And, and the, uh, the filtered for the sky. I always like to mention this, an orange filter, is it? Yeah, I use an orange filter. I very seldom over-filter with black. I'm even using film now, and even with the benefit of... You know, having Photoshop at the end of the photographic production journey, I still um, filter quite conservatively. And if anyone's if anyone's convinced out there that they should go out with a black and white film, put a polarizer on the dark red filter, they are sorely <laughs> completely wrong. Don't go and do that; it will ruin many of your images. You you, you know, filtered images. Or filter, filter, use filters on, on photographs very sparingly. Uh, the, the darkest filter I generally use is, is like an orange filter. So it's yellows and orange and occasional green. Is that what you're about? Yeah, right? yellows, orange and occasional green. Um, don't often use greens when, there's, when the sky is involved because they can kind of ruin skies. It will ruin your skies. But use it sparingly. I mean, 
what what the filtration does is start separating the the tonal range, or separating or or bringing out the tonal relationship to an image prior to it even being processed. The film, which is a really nice thing, so you're starting to forge the relationships in the image, the tonal relationships in the image prior to even you know developing the film, which is a great way of doing. Somebody it. somebody said that they always use a yellow filter because it's. It's sort of, sort of is a is a standard in black and white. Is that is that true or is that just a uh, no 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 no? It's I, I I don't I don't I don't personally use a yellow filter all the time. But the reason being is that sometimes I want my images I want the subtlest palette of tones possible, yeah. and I don't want to separate them. And a yellow filter ultimately subtly increases contrast, therefore darkness, shadows, and light, and some highlights. Yeah. And 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 sometimes I don't want that. Yeah. You know I want it to be as subtle as possible. So I mean I'll 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 sort of use a yellow filter if I want the start of separation of the thing there's something that really needs pushing and separation like this I wanted the darks to be dark and the lights to be light and I wanted this stone to be separated from the background in tonality then I'll use an orange filter but that's about as far as I go okay yep great next one now mm. um, it's it, well. It's certainly not a Scottish beach, that's for sure. Uh, <laughs> um, this was actually taken in the Borisdale Valley in the Lake District. So, obviously, with black and white, we can't rely on colour information. We've got no yeah. colour information at all. Um, and so, when you actually break it down, we're all, as I've mentioned a few times, all we're using is luminosity. They like bouncing off things. Now, the highlights on these leaves is only about. Well, there's oak and there's beech, I think. So there's a few different types of leaves there. But the light bouncing off them is more or less the same as the light bouncing off the lighter part of the bark, of the tree, the twig lying on the floor. Yeah. Now, in terms of basic image structure, we've got the shape of the twigs on the floor. So they go up, so they kind of fit within the frame quite nicely. That works well. Uh, works quite well. But the other thing that is quite good in black and white, I think it always lends itself to black and white, is patterns, repeated patterns. And in a sec, this is what, this is what it is. It's textures and patterns. Yeah. We've got this complete blanket pattern of leaves, all reflecting the same diffused body of light above, which is just basically an overcast day. And we've got the entire carpet pattern. Obviously, the leaves get bigger here because of proportions and yeah. because of uh, the angle of view. And then... The only thing that breaks that pattern is the branches sitting on the leaves. In terms of a composition, I think it actually works. It's, it's very, very simple. It's very, very straightforward. But you've got this diagonal line going right across the frame there, which is one I love, I love the extension of that branch yeah. there. Yeah. Yeah, just going right across the frame there. You get, it hides itself and it reappears there. And you've got this V-shape, which is more or less, maybe it's more or less in the centre of the frame, and these two going off. There's an echoing of these twigs at the top there's two yeah. branches on them and so the position of the camera where the camera was in relation to the subject was quite important as well and then and once again just a degree of tilt so I've got the full I, th I think it's a great example of how you don't need contrast to you make a black and white shot you don't need the global areas of contrast you can do you can use texture to create a composition yeah you, you, exactly right Tim I mean you don't need you know Harsh contrast. I mean, this in, I would imagine it in what in one of the, the sort of modern magazines on the shelves now. This is never a, they've never an, an entered into a magazine to be used because they just consider it to be so damn boring because it's just mid grey. Sometimes I really like that, you know, and um, and like you say, you don't need strong contrast. You don't need really really harsh light. You, you, in fact, you know, I favour working in really subtle lights quite a lot now. Diffuse light. I like that. I like muted palette of greys. And this is, I think, if I've stuck a spot meter on this scene, which it, well, obviously I would have done, it's, I'll probably just stick it at zone five and take the yeah. picture. Yeah. As the light meter says. Because there's, there's probably there's about a stop, stop and a half in the whole thing. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. it, it exactly. If that, yeah. So there was nothing to it. So very, very simple image, but it just shows it that, you know, in terms of what black and white can offer you, that once again, there's no colour information. It was almost monochromatic in, in its own right, to be honest with you, in terms of colour information. There wasn't much colour information there. But um, this is one I think works actually better without the colour information. I think it looks great yeah. just with that silvery legs. It's you know, absolutely it's, about texture then, isn't it? Yeah, it's just about textures and, and shapes, yeah. In, in terms of tonality of black and white, there's there's... Very, I think Ansel Adams said about having every tone from black to white in his mm -hmm. pictures. I'm paraphrasing him, whatever. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. But there is there is a school of thought that says in black and white that's what that's what you do. You try and get everything 
into a picture. Now, do you work? Do you work to try and build that into your pictures to try and get, get a, um, a flowing tonal range from from black to white? Black to white. Uh, no, you... no, not necessarily. No, I mean. Um, if if we were to try and if it was, well, this was one particular maybe there are one or two blacks in it, but I I wouldn't be say say that particular part there that we the, the kind of the arrow over there that's probably one of the there was probably one or two tiny little spots of black on that image. Um, I don't necessarily work to conform to rules like that because if I was worrying about that during yeah. this particular picture, I'd be pretty daft yeah. worrying about that. No, well, the, the reason, reason I say is this this is working within just mid-tone, so yes, mid it doesn't extend across the whole range. Exactly. I mean, the, the, strangely enough, the one thing I was quite surprised, the, the front cover of my first book, Aspects of Expression, was one of, I remember vividly metering the picture, and it was of some um, some uh, the coastal scene, some groins going out into the sea, and um, on, on a beach, and I think, that, I think it was about two stops or three stops. The, the whole image was between... I think it was zone three and zone five. There was nothing else. Yeah, <laughs> it was just there was no there was no blacks and whites in it at all, you know. And so, it, what I say, it's a bit like a, you, you can use from black to white if you choose to do that, um, but there shouldn't be any golden rules. Yeah. I would never dream of saying to a painter, "You've got all them colours there, but you can't use that green. You can't use that red. You can't do that." You know, it's every everyone each their own, and so, some of the most beautiful pictures. Some of the most beautiful high key pictures I've, I've seen. I've just been, you know, just the highlights of things appear and as of a mid grey, and that's beautiful. Uh, out of your f favourite or, or other black and white photographers that you appreciate, who would you who would you recommend people look at? <laughs> oh goodness me! Appreciating other or, or things that you like. The, the thing, I mean, the, obviously the classics, Ansel Adams and. Edward Weston was fantastic. Obviously, Adams, Adams and Weston were fantastic. There's some some modern photographers, not modern photographers now, but some photographers are still working today. I mean, John Sexton's fantastic. Mark Citra is a fantastic photographer. Absolutely brilliant. Paul Gozal. I like Paul Gozal's work. Um, and there's there's a few other people that have produced some work up there. Which are, There's another guy called Huntington Witherell. Mm. Um, and, and and some of his works were really really good. I've liked some, but there's there's just so many people out there. I mean, just if you go, you go and look at some of their, their well, work. Well, yeah, I've got, I think I put a list of a few people down in my this classic Kenner. Everybody everybody seems to look at Kenner and Ansel Adams mm. at the top two opposite ends of a spectrum almost. Now and they're going and looking at things. I know, I know, it's it's true, really. I mean, I think I think the most important thing is um, when I said about exploring and things and, and trying to explore things. It's what I did when I was younger as a student. When I, I'd looked at pieces of work and lots of different individual photographers and thought, you know, maybe I was influenced by some more than others, but I don't want to try and do what they do. And what's, what's happening a lot now with some of the black and white is that people are trying to be Michael Kenner mm. and people are trying to be X or Y or Z, whatever it may be. And, and it becomes sadly kind of formulaic, you know. I mean, it's, I mean, I like long exposures as well but I mean people are just literally just doing black and white long exposures and saying that's a form and it works I'll do everything like that you know I think there's there's far more to explore between black and white than just doing that really I think I think it's, it's quite sad because Kenner doesn't Kenner isn't really that people, no but, people, but he's not he's no, exactly people, he's not people that. take bits of Kenner and and yeah. create a stereotype work out of it. Ex so, exactly you know I was but, quite amused last year when somebody got accused of copying somebody who was copying Kenner <laughs> there's a, I'm not going to name any names, but it seems to be getting to the point now where there's a family tree of Kenner. Uh, and now it's lights. well, some it's like Ralph Horn, some of his lovely work, Ralph Horn, but it can it kind of sometimes looks similar to Michael yeah. Kenner's work. You know, but there are, the, the, I think there's always going to be comparisons with other people. And when you were starting up, who was the who were the black and white peers then? I mean, was it Brandt and? Um, and I mean, the Americans, Adams and Western. It was. It was mostly. It was mostly Adams and Western, really, really that. Yeah. That appealed to me because I, mean, I always say when I first saw the books, I mean, I, all my all my friends were reading all the colour books, and I was just thinking, I'm not interested. The black and white stuff was stunning for me, and I couldn't grasp what I found stunning in the images when I first looked. I was just, I just, they are unbelievable, and they look so real. And the reason why they look so real is that the interrelation of tones within the image, well, that beautifully finely tuned 
that it kind of resonated in me. It was perfect. It was absolutely perfect the way they were printed and the way they were reproduced. And I, I think that was one of the things. It wasn't because they were done on 1080 and they were sharp. It wasn't about that. It was about the tone range and the images. And that's something that's always the most paramount importance to me is the tone range of the image. You know, providing the structure of it and you've understood the luminosity and the light that's being reflected from the landscape. And then you understand that when you're adjusting the tone range at the printing stage, which is incredibly important in black and white, then you kind of some way into producing a good black and white picture. Fantastic. Okay. Thank you very much. You're welcome. You're more than welcome.